On behalf of the science departments at Ball State, I welcome you to the fourth lecture in this series. There's one final lecture that will be held this evening at 7.30 in this auditorium, and we invite you to return for that. On your program, you have the necessary biographical information concerning our speaker for this hour, and I'll give you credit for being able to read that, and I won't read it to you. You will notice on this that he has recently returned from the Ames Research Laboratory to the Washington office, and either while he was in Ames or since he's returned to Washington, he has become very adept at evasiveness. I was unable ever to reach him by telephone. I did talk to his secretary several times and found her to be very friendly and very nice. In fact, I considered inviting her to come in his place. I could say about our speaker this afternoon that he, or at least his research, is out of this world. He's dealing with extraterrestrial life. If you have difficulty with biology at the local level, you can remember that he has taken on the subject of the biology of the universe. And it gives me great pleasure to present to you Dr. Richard Young, Chief Exobiologist at NASA in Washington, D.C. Dr. Young. First of all, my apologies for our inability to communicate, Dr. Walker. It is a problem. As a matter of fact, I, I think it's probably one of our most serious problems. I hope, however, this afternoon that uh, I'll be able to communicate at least some of what we're interested in in the space program that's relevant to the question of extraterrestrial life. In the course of um, discussion, I'd like to cover a number of, of aspects, such as how or what sequence of events we think took place on the planet Earth during its formation that was relevant to the origin of life on Earth, what we think about this same sequence of events perhaps having occurred on some other planet in our solar system, or perhaps on some other planet in the universe. The question of uh, the presence or absence of extraterrestrial life is, I think, now a very fundamental problem for the biological sciences, and one that can really be only be approached by exploring uh, other planets, where we'll have an opportunity to have a comparative biology, if you will. The, uh, the other disciplines, physics, chemistry, mathematics, are essentially universal sciences. The science of biology is strictly a terrestrial science. We don't know whether it's a universal science or not. We suspect that it is, and part of my discussion today will reflect the reasons why we suspect uh, extraterrestrial life uh, may well exist, and also how we hope to go about uh, finding out whether it does exist and what its characteristics are. Now, first of all, we make certain basic assumptions which may or may not be valid, but in which we find reasonable agreement with our physics and astronomy colleagues about when and how the planets originated and what the environment of the early planets probably was. And if we can start with the first slide, we get the projector warmed up, I'll give you a little better idea of what I'm talking about. The basic assumption is that at the time when the planets were being formed, at least in this solar system, um, the elements of the solar system were present 
in proportion to their cosmic abundance. And this can be measured. We know roughly what the cosmic abundance of the elements is. It's a tremendous excess of hydrogen. Next most abundant element is carbon. The next most abundant element, nitrogen, oxygen, and so forth. The interesting thing about this is that, that these elements, in this proportion with the excess of hydrogen in a primitive atmosphere at a time the planet was condensing from the uh, primitive gas cloud or nebula, would have given you an atmosphere composed of hydrogen, reduced carbon, methane, reduced nitrogen, ammonia, and reduced oxygen, if you will, which is water. And indeed, uh, there's general agreement that this is probably what the primitive atmosphere was. It was composed of methane, ammonium, and water, very different from today's atmosphere. We feel that today's atmosphere, at least on the Earth, is probably largely the result of biological activity. Now, we also know that during the formation of the planet, there were a number of energy sources available, such as ultraviolet light from the sun, electrical discharge, uh, say in the form of lightning, ionizing radiation, uh, even heat, either geothermally produced or even heat from uh, meteoritic impact. So we have a, essentially then uh, an experimental situation. We can take a primitive atmosphere and put it in a bottle, subject it to one or more of these kinds of en energy, and the, uh, you have a, a very neat experiment. The first experiment was done by Stanley Miller at the University of Chicago in about 1953 where he subjected uh, such an atmosphere to electrical discharge. And he found that amino acids were synthesized. Well, this is a very exciting experiment, because until that experiment uh, was done, it was generally considered that uh, amino acids were the products of biological syntheses. All organic matter, in fact, is, was generally considered to be of biological origin. Here we showed that key building blocks of biological systems could be synthesized in a very primitive sort of an experiment, the kind of experiment that one would have expected nature to perform very early in the history of the Earth. We now know from extensions of this kind of experiment that not only amino acids are synthesized, but actually polypeptides are synthesized, primitive protein molecules, some of which actually have enzymatic activity. Purines, pyrimidines, these are the, the bases of DNA, genetic material, carbohydrates, fatty acids. ATP has been synthesized in this fashion, nucleosides, nucleotides. The important thing is that essentially all of the building blocks of biological systems, it seems, must have been synthesized very early in the history of the planet, perhaps collecting in the primitive ocean, so that you ended up with what Oparin calls uh, a primeval soup. Now, of course, the next question is, uh, all right, so what? Where did the first cell come from? Is it uh, necessarily, does it necessarily follow that this kind of chemistry took place that uh, a living system, self-replicating, mutating, uh, living entity uh, must have followed? Well, we certainly don't know the answer to that question. But this kind of a pathway, I think, is extremely suggestive and uh, I think many of the, the next steps where even larger molecules are synthesized uh, to ultimately we may reach something that we might define uh, as a living cell can uh, reasonably be synthesized in the laboratory. Uh, time will tell. Next slide, please. This is an illustration of the kind of device that's used in the laboratory to do the sort of experiment I just described. We have in the upper part of the flask uh, the primitive atmosphere of the Earth, if you will. The lower part of the flask, the primitive ocean. We have Tesla coils attached to electrodes projecting into the chamber. The current is turned on, spark the gap, and we have simulated lightning in the flask. It's a, uh, a uh, recycling condensing system. And you'll notice that the upper portion of the flask is already turned brown. It was clear. It contained nothing but a methane, ammonium, uh, water vapor mixture at the beginning. Now the entire flask is coated with organic matter, much of which uh, has not yet been identified, but among which are the amino acids, purines, pyrimidines, and what have you that uh, I described. These then can be collected in the primitive ocean and removed uh, for analyses uh, in the laboratory. 
Now, there are many variations on this theme, as you might expect. Uh, ultraviolet light, as I said, can be used as the energy source instead of electrical discharge, heat. It doesn't seem to make much difference. The important thing is that these biologically significant organic molecules uh, are synthesized in uh, surprisingly high yields. Now, in addition to this kind of very suggestive chemistry, we're engaged in looking at the ancient history of the Earth as represented in the sedimentary rocks of the Earth. Uh, recent dating of uh, ancient rocks has indicated that the Earth probably originated around four and a half billion years ago. The next slide is an illustration of a geologic clock. It takes a bit to see what we're driving at in this, but I, I think it will be clear. What we have from this point, which is considered to be the origin of the Earth, four and a half billion years ago, the entire history of the Earth represented in geological and biological terms up to the present time. We feel that, and as I said, in analyzing ancient rocks, we now have rocks dating back to uh, oh, 3.3, 3, 3 and a half billion years ago, and find that uh, life was already on Earth three and a half billion years ago. We have fossils of microorganisms that are evident in sediment, the fig tree sediment 3.2 billion years ago, the gunflint chert 2.7 billion years ago. We have uh, organic molecules, uh, which we would ordinarily think were biological in origin, dating back to 3.5 to 3.7 billion years. The point is that if we already have microorganisms complex enough to leave a fossil uh, behind at 3.2 billion years, life must have arisen at some point considerably before that. The question is, of course, how much before that? Um, uh, that may be an unanswerable question, but uh, it's clear that it fell in here somewhere. All of this period, by the way, is called the Precambrian. Man, you'll notice, has been on Earth for only a very small fraction of the history of the Earth. We're relative newcomers, and uh, maybe that thought will put us in our place. I don't know. The next slide illustrates some of these sediments, these rocks, uh, very old rocks, 1 billion years, 1.9, 2.1, 2.7, 3.1 billion years. And as I said, all of these have some evidence of either intact organisms, primarily microorganisms, primitive bacteria, blue-green algae perhaps, uh, or organic molecules that we generally associate with biological activity. One of our problems, of course, is to distinguish between, back in, in ancient history, between molecules that were produced by living systems and molecules that were produced before there were living systems by some natural abiogenic uh, type experiment. And obviously, all of these problems will apply when we start looking at extraterrestrial samples. And we're not far from doing exactly that. We'll have returned lunar samples in our laboratories on Earth probably within the next two or three years, or perhaps even sooner, uh, where we'll be able to do these kinds of analyses and look for this kind of evidence. Eventually, of course, we hope to get Martian samples or any planet. Next slide, please. This is simply a uh, graph showing the different amino acids that have already been isolated from uh, the fig tree chert from South Africa, which is, <coughs> excuse me, as I said, over three billion years old. These are the oldest known amino acids which we think are probably of biological origin. The only point here is that there already was a good spectrum of amino acids. Next slide, please. This is a, a so-called living fossil. This organism on this side, this is a very poor picture, by the way, um, was isolated from the gunflint chert, um, about 2.7 billion years old, from northern Michigan. Um, the interesting thing about it is that morphologically, it's remarkably similar to a specimen which was obtained from soil outside of Harlech Castle in uh, Wales. Now, as I say, the similarity, of course, uh, since this is a fossil and this is a living organism, 
can only be based on uh, limited morphology. But the, uh, the similarities are striking. The thing that makes it uh, interesting is that this organism has a high ammonium requirement. And uh, if we start thinking back in terms of the primitive Earth, we have to question what was the primitive environment like at the time life arose? Was it, uh, it probably wasn't much like today's environment. It may still have had considerable traces of ammonium in the atmosphere. Now, this question, as I said, of abiogenesis, synthesis of biologically significant organic molecules, uh, as it occurred on the primitive Earth or some other planet, is very difficult to trace right now because the Earth is crawling with biology, if you will. There's practically nowhere on Earth where we don't have at least bacteria, and uh, thus it's practically impossible for us to tell whether we're dealing with um, biologically produced organic molecules or non-biologically produced organic molecules. There are, however, a few quasi-primitive environments on the Earth where we can ask this kind of a question. The next slide illustrates one such environment, a volcano. This particular volcano is uh, a brand new island, well, about three years ago now, Surtsey, off the southern coast of Iceland, which some of you may have read about. We actually, I don't recommend this for weekend sport, but uh, we actually visited uh, the island in order to get some of the ash from the erupting volcano, collect it uh, in our hot little hands before it hit the ground and became contaminated biologically so that we could analyze it chemically to see whether there were any organic molecules being synthesized with the heat of the volcano, the energy source, and the volcanic gases, the substrate, if you will. Uh, in brief, um, we found evidence of amino acids in this volcanic ash, a limited number of amino acids. We can't yet be absolutely certain that uh, we didn't introduce a contaminant somewhere along the line, but we think we have evidence that even on the contemporary Earth, in very specialized environments where there is no biological activity, organic molecules may be synthesized be being synthesized non-biologically. Now, where do we want to go in our solar system in order to look for real evidence of biological activity? As I said, we're anticipating return samples from the moon where we think we can get some of this kind of data, but we certainly don't expect to find living organisms uh, in any great numbers on the moon although there may be, uh, it's within the realm of possibility that there will be viable uh, spores found on the moon, but I'll come back to that subject. The planets, the most Earth-like of the planets are, of course, Venus and Mars. We more or less rule out Mercury because of the high surface temperatures and lack of atmosphere. The temperatures on Mercury are literally prohibitive or the survival of uh, organic molecules, and certainly any biological system that we might uh, imagine uh, based on organic molecules. Venus uh, has generally been thought to be too hot at the surface, and the recent Russian probe and the recent U.S. probe to Venus certainly uh, did nothing to dispel these fears. It looks as though the surface temperatures on Venus are somewhere between 5 and 700 degrees Fahrenheit, which is, uh, uh, needless to say, prohibitive. There are special situations that we can speculate about in the upper atmosphere of Venus, but uh, perhaps we can come back to that in the discussion period. Mars is probably, uh, we know more about Mars probably than any of the other planets mainly because we can see the surface of Mars. We can't see the surface of Venus. We never have. It's uh, perpetually cloud-covered and uh, not visible. Mars, on the other hand, is quite visible and has been viewed by astronomers for uh, many, many years. In fact, Mars is a little bit too visible. Uh, astronomers have speculated rather wildly, I think, about life on Mars, but uh, we'll discuss that in more detail, too. Jupiter is much further removed from the sun, of course, much more massive planet, also a much colder planet. The atmosphere of Jupiter, interestingly enough, is a 
is essentially a primitive atmosphere. It contains methane, ammonium, and uh, probably water vapor, or ice crystals. And as such, we're extremely interested in the possibilities of organic chemistry, prebiotic organic chemistry going on in the atmosphere of, of Jupiter. I don't think uh, we can seriously speculate about the possibilities for life on Jupiter, at least at this time. The remaining planets, of course, get even further from the sun or even colder, and from the point of view of biology, probably even less interesting. Planets in other solar systems, we can only speculate about, um, since we can, only, we can really only speculate about their existence, let alone uh, whether there's life. Now let's take a look at Mars, the next slide. Is one of the best photographs of Mars that's been taken through a telescope. And uh, you'll notice that you really can't see much. It has, however, certain features that are obvious. There are light spots, light regions, darker regions, and still darker regions. There's a pole cap. And in the other season, the other hemisphere, there's a, also a pole cap. We also know, astronomers have observed for years, what happened to Mars. The, uh, the dark areas of Mars become increasingly dark during the Martian spring in that particular hemisphere, you know, the so-called wave of darkening that proceeds from pole to equator. For years, astronomers have felt that this wave of darkening was a, a biological response to water becoming available from the melting pole cap. It goes something like this. The pole cap, which probably comes down oh, around 50 degrees in winter, begins to recede. Uh, the pole cap, by the way, we know contains water, probably also frozen carbon dioxide. Um, as it recedes, the dark region, as like I said, becomes increasingly darker, right down and even through the equator. Uh, suggesting a biological response to the uh, availability of water. Uh, I personally don't believe that, but uh, uh, mainly because this wave of darkening begins um, at a time where the temperature is about minus 75 degrees centigrade, very cold. Uh, the reason for this is the very thin atmosphere pole cap probably doesn't melt in the strict sense of the word. It probably sublimes. Liquid water, if it exists on Mars, is probably very tenuous. Uh, exists only in a very transient fashion. This, by the way, my own feeling, is probably the limiting factor on Mars, the availability of water. The pressure, atmospheric pressure, the surface of Mars is about uh, uh, one one hundredth or perhaps even one one thousandth of that in the Earth's atmosphere. Um, about 10 millibars, the equivalent of something like 150, 200,000 feet in the Earth's atmosphere. A very rare atmosphere. The atmosphere, however, does contain water, about 14 microns of precipitable water, which is about one one thousandth of that that one would see in the Earth's atmosphere if one were to make a similar measurement. This is, of course, a couple of orders of magnitude drier than the driest deserts on Earth and simply must be uh, a limiting factor from the point of view of biology. Uh, as I said, water has been detected in the Martian atmosphere. So has um, carbon dioxide. As a matter of fact, the predominant molecule on Mars is probably carbon dioxide. Oxygen has not been detected. And at best, there are probably only traces of oxygen on Mars. However, this doesn't necessarily preclude biological activity. The uh, bright areas have been considered to be the Martian deserts, if you will. Early astronomers also saw a network of canals, the famous canals of Mars, that presumably connected the pole cap to the deserts and was a series of canals dug by Martian engineers to move water from the poles to where it was needed. We're now reasonably convinced that the Martian canals are optical illusions. And uh, with the total amount of water available on Mars, this pole cap, by the way, is probably nothing more than a layer of frost. The total amount of water on Mars uh, would hardly fill an intricate system of canals at any time. 
Next slide, please. This is a photograph of Mars taken by the recent, uh, well, two or three years ago now, Mariner flyby of Mars. The, uh, this is about 100 kilometers on a side, give you some idea of the resolution. And I think you can see clearly that you still can't see anything clearly on Mars. The interesting feature is that there are craters on Mars. This immediately led the newspapers to state that Mars is a dead planet, there's no life on Mars. What they neglected to say is that if the identical photographs were taken of the planet Earth from a similar satellite, we would have had to conclude by the same logic that there's no life on Earth. You can't detect life with photographs with this kind of resolution. It was not designed to detect life, and it wasn't reasonable to expect this kind of, uh, of a mission to tell us anything about life on Mars, and indeed it didn't. To get, uh, as a matter of fact, we now have many thousands of photographs of the Earth taken from Tyros and Nimbus satellites, none of which have detected life on Earth. So again, our very existence is suspect. <laughs> Next slide, please. Now, this is a, simply a table with some uh, comparative figures uh, concerning the Earth and Mars. The mass of Mars is about one-tenth of that of the Earth. Its diameter is about one-half gravitational field about one-third. The length of its year, interestingly enough, is about twice ours, not quite. This has interesting biological implications. Its day length, on the other hand, is about the same. It's considerably further from the sun, and the impact that this has on biology, of course, is that it means that its mean temperature is considerably lower mean temperature of Mars is probably about 40 or 50 degrees below that of the Earth, and indeed poses some problems. Even at the Martian equator, where the daytime temperature uh, is perfectly compatible with biological activity, about 75 degrees perhaps, at nighttime it's about uh, uh, minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit. That's at the equator. The Martian poles, of course, are roughly around uh, 100 degrees below zero. Um, it's a very cold planet. The time at the Martian equator during which the temperature gets above freezing during the daytime is also probably limited to something like four and a half or five and a half hours. So when you start thinking about the potential for biological activity, even at the equator on Mars, uh, we're, we're straining a bit. Now, in terms of its moons, we have one, Mars has two. Mars moons are much more interesting in a sense than ours in that they're extremely small, um, about a one to two kilometers in diameter, and move in such a fashion that astronomers, some astronomers at least, have been led to speculate about the possibility that the moons of Mars are indeed artificial satellites. That's not the subject of this lecture. Now we've taken the Martian environment and uh, sort of put it in a box. And the reason we've done this is to expose terrestrial forms of life to what we think is the Martian environment for two reasons. First of all, we're going to go to Mars eventually and land devices, which I'll discuss, aimed at detecting life on Mars. We want to be certain that these devices detect Martian life, not Earth life that we've carried along on the spacecraft. Therefore, we have to know something about the potential for terrestrial microorganisms to survive the trip and actually land, survive, and perhaps even grow uh, on Mars. We've done uh, many experiments aimed at these questions, the survivability and the ability for growth under simulated Martian conditions. And we can make a couple of conclusions. One is that there are many terrestrial organisms that can easily survive the Martian environment. The second is that there are some, if not many, terrestrial organisms can grow in the Martian environment if water is present. 
The next slide illustrates one such experiment where we've taken a common bacterium, Aerobacter orogenes, put it, in this case, we have speculated that there is water on Mars, even if it's only available in very localized regions, the, the Martian equivalent of an oasis, or the, uh, the ocean bed, uh, the ancient ocean on Mars, which has evaporated to dryness, but leaving water tightly bound in salt deposits. But we assumed that the organism did find water. This is the control curve in, in the laboratory at laboratory temperature. These organisms were given, uh, I think, four and a half hours of time during which the temperature was above freezing, room temperature, four and a half hours. At this point, they were frozen at about minus 100 degrees for the remaining 19 and a half hours out of a 24-hour cycle. The following day, they're thawed out, and you'll notice that there's a drop in population, but uh, a significant portion of the population survives, uh, grows during the next four and a half hour cycle, frozen again for 19 and a half hours, still some killing due to freezing and thawing, but the point is that the culture, uh, by and large, is perfectly capable of growth, uh, and this is in a Martian atmosphere. We have fudged only in one way, and that is that the, we've made the assumption that, it, that there is water. Now, next slide, uh, I think, illustrates an experiment in which we've made the conditions even more rigorous by shortening the day length to 15 minutes. Well, let's, the spacecraft landed further from the equator. The time during which the temperature was above, 50, uh, above the freezing point of water was only 15 minutes. Uh, this was a highly adapted culture, as you might take in, organisms taken from preceding type experiments. But here we see very little killing due to freezing and thawing. These organisms are thawed for 15 minutes, frozen for uh, 23 hours and 45 minutes at uh, minus 100 degrees, and uh, very little killing due to freezing and thawing, and we get a, a normal growth curve. The remarkable thing here is that these organisms now, uh, it takes them about 45 minutes to divide. This means they're being frozen in the midst of the cell division and simply go ahead and complete that division when they're thawed out. Uh, with apparently no adverse effects. A rather, I think, uh, remarkable adaptation. Next slide, please. This is simply an illustration of the kind of chamber that we use to do this kind of an experiment. The uh, Mars is inside the box here, heavy insulation. The uh, upper end of the chamber is cooled using liquid nitrogen so that we simulate the pole at one end of the chamber. The infrared lamps at the other end simulate the equator, so we have a hemisphere of the planet then from pole to equator. The uh, temperatures are monitored in the soil in the chamber, and we simulate Martian soil, which we think is probably high in iron, probably some kind of a limonite. Cycled through Martian day-night and Martian seasonal cycles. Um, we started out initially using this strictly as a physical model to see if we could show ways in which water might be available on the planet, in spite of the fact that so little is detectable in the atmosphere. We found that if we started out with a wet planet, and surely Mars had water, in, at least in its early atmosphere, but because of its low mass, lost most of its water to space. How quickly, we don't know, but it can be roughly calculated. Uh, we assumed that it had water, started cycling a dry atmosphere through the chamber, simulating the loss of moisture to space by pulling water out of the atmosphere using a liquid nitrogen cold finger. And what we found was that a permafrost layer formed below the surface in the model. This is what we thought might happen on the surface of the planet. A considerable amount of moisture was tied up below the surface then in the form of, of the Martian equivalent of a permafrost layer. And we have permafrost on Earth, but only in northern latitudes. On Mars, it goes all the way from pole to equator in the model. This then allowed us to speculate considerably about ways in which water might be made available. All you need is a little local geothermal activity, and you have the Martian equivalent of a, of a hot spring, if you will, uh, where biological activity might be considerably different than in average uh, conditions on the planet. Also, as I mentioned, the wave of darkening on Mars goes from pole to equator. If we were to look for a wave of darkening on Earth in the spring, we'd see it. Leaves coming out in the spring. The problem would be that uh, it would go from equator to pole. 
we can reason that the limiting factor on Earth in spring is temperature. Of course, temperature increases from equator to pole in the spring. On Mars, however, the limiting factor may well not be temperature, but the availability of water. So the question is, in our model, where does water first become available from this permafrost layer um, as we introduce spring, if you will, into the chamber? And it turns out that, uh, as I probably didn't say, but the permafrost layer is deeper at the equator than it is at the pole. The permafrost layer uh, actually is continuous with the pole cap at the pole and considerably below the surface at the equator. We find that uh, when we introduce spring to a simulator like this, the water first becomes available from the permafrost layer in polar latitudes and uh, actually begins to melt the permafrost layer from pole toward the equator. Well, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon. I, I still find it hard to correlate that with biological activity, but uh, we can't rule out the possibility. Needless to say, the engineering problems in developing a device like this, which has to operate at uh, um, 10 millibars of pressure, it's a substantial vacuum, and uh, be tightly sealed, uh, is quite a problem. The next slide, as a matter of fact, illustrates what happens when Mars springs a leak. And, uh, which it does occasionally. Next slide, please. We now have a more sophisticated chamber. This is a new version of a Martian-type simulator. The Martian environment is in the body of the chamber. This is an airlock, which allows us to introduce samples. We can actually introduce uh, experimental hardware, life detection devices, uh, into the chamber and test our capability to detect life under Martian conditions as well as under terrestrial conditions. This is a solar simulator so that we can simulate the solar flux uh, on the surface of the planet uh, and so forth. It's simply a more versatile chamber. Well, I mentioned that um, another likely way in which Mars could hang on to water is in salt deposits from primitive oceans which have evaporated essentially to dryness. And here we find we have an interesting model on Earth. Next slide, please. For example, the Great Salt Lake, which some of you have probably seen. You'll notice the reddish coloring along the shore where the salt concentration is the highest. This is due to microorganisms, bacteria, and primarily, and algae in the water. These organisms are really remarkable. Next slide. These are um, salt evaporators in San Francisco Bay down near San Jose where the more concentrated the, these are isolated from the bay, water pools, which are being evaporated to collect the salt. But you'll notice in these highly concentrated ones, just almost blood red, very high concentration of uh, <laughs> microorganisms growing in essentially a saturated salt solution. The next slide. These halophilic bacteria are indeed remarkable, particularly the obligate halophiles. These organisms are being grown in salt concentrations, sodium chloride in this case, from 1% up to almost saturated, 25%. The remarkable thing is that you'll notice the organism prefers the highest concentration. These obligate halophiles ha have an internal environment uh, which is about the same as the outside of the cell. This means their enzymes are actually functioning uh, in saturated salt solution, which ordinarily, of course, uh, is quite lethal to uh, uh, proteins and enzymes, uh, but not to these. We think this kind of organism, this kind of metabolism, uh, is certainly a likely candidate for a Martian kind of an environment. Next slide, please. In fact, these organisms, unfortunately, the artist gave me a red background, so nobody believes a word of this. But these are salt crystals in which the reddish color in the crystal is due to the same, these same bacteria actually growing in a salt crystal. The remarkable thing about this is that it can be calculated that in order for these organisms to compete with a salt crystal for water, to pull water molecules away from the salt crystal, uh, they have to probably expend the bulk of their energy. 
In fact, uh, if you calculate the energy required to pull water away from uh, crystal salt under these conditions, it comes out to about the same as the organism would have to expend to get water out of the atmosphere of Mars. That's, um, again, I think suggestive. It doesn't prove anything. Now, what about the extremes of environment that terrestrial life is able to cope with? What do we really know about it? Turns out that we don't know too much. Ordinarily, the biologist in studying an organism will bring the organism into his laboratory and put it under the, most, the best of conditions, the, most, the optimum conditions for that organism. We really know uh, very little about what the environmental tolerances of life based on carbon chemistry is capable of. The next slide gives us uh, at least some look into the kinds of environmental extremes that are survived by certain kinds of microorganisms to give us some feel for this problem. In terms of radiation, for example, up to probably more than 10 to the sixth Ronkins. In terms of solutes, copper sulfate, citric acid, phenol, all standard disinfecting agents are survived by many bacteria and fungi as Anyone who's ever been to a hospital probably knows. Um, carbon monoxide is actually produced by bacterium hydrogenomonas. Temperature, five hours at 140 degrees. And in fact, some recent experiments, we've shown that some bacteria, if there's any particulate matter around, a few grains of dust, for example, will tolerate uh, up to 170 degrees, which interestingly enough is around the melting point of DNA, uh, for as much as 24 hours. Uh, down to as close to absolute zero as we can get. In fact, very cold temperatures are routinely used to preserve bacteria, as many of you probably know. In terms of vacuum, uh, five days at 10 to the minus ninth and probably considerably lower than that, although when we get down below 10 to the uh, minus ninth, um, we have technical problems in maintaining vacuums with uh, living organisms in them. Well, that's survival. What about growth? The next slide illustrates a similar table where we look at the question of environmental extremes and growth. There are reports in the literature of growth of fungi and bacteria at temperatures down to minus 18 degrees. I think if we looked into it seriously, we'd find that probably temperatures far lower than that are capable of supporting growth, particularly if there's liquid water around. And in fact, recent studies have shown that even at minus 70 degrees in ice, there are still pockets of liquid water. Enzymes will degrade at minus 70 degrees. And until you stop essentially all molecular movement, I think biological activity can't be excluded. It gets difficult to measure because of the time factors. Certainly, they grow very slowly at these temperatures. The point is that they will grow. Right on up to 104 degrees centigrade, uh, this is cheating a bit because it's at 1,000 atmospheres, so that's not really boiling water. But uh, we don't even know the, the upper limit for uh, growth. pH, uh, pH is of around zero. In the case of thiobacillus thiooxidans, which produces sulfuric acid, uh, if it doesn't find itself at a pH of something approaching zero, it will produce enough sulfuric acid until it gets the pH down there, on up to uh, around uh, probably 12 or 13 on the alkaline side. Pressures of essentially zero, vacuum, on up to probably considerably more than 1,400 atmospheres in the case of deep sea bacteria. Salinity, double distilled water, water with absolutely nothing in it, still manages to support heterotrophic bacteria, up to saturated brines, the kind of uh, um, bacteria I just described. In terms of total environment, the ocean bottoms all the way to the top of Mount Everest. And in fact, we've investigated samples from 27,500 feet in Mount Everest and found that all such samples contain living organisms, some of which were reasonably certain were actually growing uh, in such a locale. The point is that um, we really can't find anywhere on Earth where there isn't some form of biological activity. The most ubiquitous form of biological activity, of course, uh, is the microorganisms. Some of the environmental extremes on Earth in which we find biological activity are quite similar to, or at least not too far removed from, Martian environments. So if we accept the basic premise 
that Mars originated and had a similar early history to that of, that of the Earth, then there's no reason to think that Mars could not have at least made a stab at producing a living system. It should at least contain chemical relics of its early history, which would tell us a lot about what might have gone on on the primitive Earth, and perhaps may well contain uh, living organisms. Certainly, if living organisms exist, they'll be at the microorganismal level. Uh, they're the most, as I said, ubiquitous forms of life on Earth, and we would apply the same logic to Mars. If we're going to look for life on Earth, we wouldn't look for horses. The odds would be too much against it. Uh, there are too many places we could land on Earth and not detect horses. On the other hand, there's practically nowhere on Earth we could land and not detect bacteria. Now, how are we going to go about detecting life? Well, as I said, first of all, we have to make sure that the life we detect is indigenous to the environment that we're looking into, Mars. In order to do this, we have to be certain that our spacecraft aren't harboring microorganisms. This in itself is a monumental problem. Next slide. It's uh, considerably more complex than uh, sterilizing a B-52. Uh, first of all, where do you get an autoclave big enough to put a, a spacecraft in, if that's uh, the method of choice? But uh, it is a serious problem, and one that NASA is taking seriously. We have facilities in which spacecraft can be assembled under uh, clean uh, conditions. We have terminal sterilization cycles to which the, at least that part of the spacecraft that will impact the planet will be exposed. And uh, we're making every effort to see to it that we don't contaminate uh, the planets before we satisfy our scientific curiosity. We, of course, have to worry about the reverse problem, bringing samples back from the planets to the Earth and not contaminating the Earth. And this is a very immediate problem for us with regard to return lunar samples. And in fact, uh, we've now developed in Houston a quarantine facility, if you will, for return lunar samples to be certain that it contains nothing hazardous to uh, terrestrial life forms. Next slide, please. Now, through the years, uh, the last several years, there have been a number of devices which have been designed to be landed on the surface primarily of Mars, but really any planet, including the Moon, uh, which are aimed at looking for one or more of the basic attributes of love, uh, life. For example, all life on Earth, as I said, is composed of organic molecules. One of the experiments that we certainly want to do is a chemical analysis, see if there are organic molecules on uh, the planet X. Metabolic activity is a widespread phenomenon of life on Earth and uh, metabolic activity or growth and reproduction, another basic attribute of living systems, are what these devices are uh, aimed at. This particular one called the wolf trap actually sucks up a sample of the planet and dumps it into a nutrient medium. The sample then, or the medium, is then monitored for changes in optical density, uh, same as you would do in the laboratory. Inoculate a culture, um, monitor the uh, turbidity of the culture to see if organisms grow. Very simple, straightforward experiment. Unfortunately, you have to make a number of guesses. You have to guess about what substrate to provide the Martian microorganism. Maybe it doesn't like glucose the way terrestrial organisms do. Maybe it is a halophilic organism. If we take an obligate halophile and dump it into an aqueous medium, it immediately dissolves. So the very life detection system we contemplate flying may simply dissolve the extraterrestrial organism we're looking for. There are many problems with this and, and of course, all such experiments. The next device, uh, I think I have a, I think the next slide is an enlargement of this. Yes, the Gulliver. This is, operates on a slightly different principle. These little projectiles are actually launched out onto the surface of the planet. There's a sticky string attached to the bullet. The string is slowly reeled back in to a chamber, which also contains a nutrient medium. In this case, uh, let's say it's glucose. Uh, the glucose is isotopically tagged at C14 glucose, the theory being that whatever adheres to the sticky string is scraped off into the medium, metabolizes the C14 glucose, and evolves C14O2, which is monitored by means of a Geiger counter 
uh, mounted above the chamber. The dimensions here, by the way, are about uh, three inches by two inches. These things are, are very highly miniaturized uh, little laboratories. Well, again, you have to make uh, a number of assumptions in this kind of an experiment about what the organism is going to like and uh, what uh, its waste product of metabolism will be. And it's, a, it's sort of a long shot experiment. We're now looking into more sophisticated experiments. Next slide, please. Um, this, by the way, is uh, not something we're going to fly. This is a laboratory instrument. What we've done is simply broadened the wolf trap concept. We take a sample of soil, introduce it into this chamber. The gases in the chamber are monitored by means of three gas chromatographic columns. Now we don't have to look for the evolution of carbon dioxide. We can monitor all the gases as a function of time over a sample of soil. And uh, we could actually do this experiment in situ on the surface of the planet. And presumably, um, then we're not limited to the evolution of carbon dioxide. Any gas that's produced as a function of biological activity could be detected. The next slide illustrates a growth chamber, which is a modification of the wolf trap type chamber. If you recall, I said the wolf trap soil is actually dumped into the nutrient medium. This gives you immediately some background noise. If you're passing a light beam through the medium, you can't distinguish soil particles from microorganisms. In this case, uh, if you look at the next slide, the soil is put on a shelf. The medium is in the bottom of the chamber. The two are connected by filter paper. The soil is wet by capillary action. Microorganisms migrate back down the capillaries and inoculate the medium. The light beam then is passed through the chamber. And you'll notice, if you remember the preceding slide, there was a growth curve plotted uh, underneath the chamber. We get a very quick uh, measure of growth without any background noise in the system. The next slide is a, an automated chemistry laboratory in which we can do completely automated uh, many routine chemical analyses. We can do infrared spectroscopy, ultraviolet spectroscopy, uh, soil, we can extract soil, look for amino acids, proteins, purines, pyrimidines. We can do a whole spectrum of organic analyses um, controlled from Earth, have reagents uh, flushed through the chambers on Mars by the scientist on Earth. Data is transmitted back, uh, telemetered back, uh, and can actually, the scientist can actually direct his own experiment. Well, you'll notice that, that the three experiments that I described here involve the detection of organic chemistry, metabolism, and growth. If we tied all three of these together, as in the next slide, we would have then a growth chamber from which gas samples can be removed, monitored with the gas chromatographic columns, looking for evidence of metabolic activity. Growth can be monitored by passing a light beam, in this case a laser, through the growth chamber, looking for increase in numbers of particles as a function of time. Either solid or liquid samples can be run through an automated chemistry laboratory and uh, analyzed chemically. And we would have data on three very critical and fundamental biological criteria. I think if we got yes answers to all three of these analyses from uh, even as little as a milligram of the surface of Mars, uh, we'd all be convinced that we were dealing with biological activity. We think that ultimately it's going to take this kind of sophistication to resolve the question of whether there is or is not life on Mars or perhaps some other planet. If we go to Mars and do not find cities and trees, uh, that shouldn't be in the least discouraging. And in fact, it won't be. It uh, will take probably this kind of an experiment to really answer the question. Well, in conclusion, I, I hope that um, that no one on the planet uh, X outside of Alpha Centauri is looking for life on Earth the way we're contemplating looking for life on Mars. We might find it a traumatic experience. The next slide uh, might illustrate some of the problems. Also, if we had probably, if we had our choice, the ultimate experience, experiment for life detection on Mars, would be illustrated in the last slide, which I'll let you interpret for yourselves. <laughs>
Last slide, please. The problem you have, of course, is trying to determine whether you were dealing with intelligent extraterrestrial life or not. And, um, uh, but that's the subject of another lecture. Thank you. Before you leave, please, uh, there is an announcement to be made, so let, we'll have a short break from this. I do wish to express our appreciation to Dr. Young for his lecture and for giving us some ideas to what is concerned with determination of whether there's life on other planets. At the luncheon today, I said I could relax because Dr. Young had arrived. Dr. Cooper said he could relax this evening when all the people who came to the reception were gone. Uh, he has an important announcement to make. We're sorry to bother you, but we do want the people to get home who have already made arrangements to go to the reception for our guests and for the staff members. So the traffic uh, personnel has asked that I make this announcement and hope that it gets to everyone. We'll be parking on the north side of the highway. And it would be wise for those driving just to park on the highway There'll be traffic patrol there and walk from the car to the yard. The yard is harder than the drive, I'm afraid. And uh, leave the parking lights on. And then upon leaving, drive right on to the next highway, the next solid highway, and back into Muncie. There'll be student patrol and police patrol and so you'll be driving west and we'll just park on the north side of the highway and we will thank everybody and and the police will not be responsible for liability and if you leave enough space between the cars anyone can get out thanks to all of you for listening to this we're sorry we had to make it you should have had freezing weather <laughs> Now, for those who have to leave or who wish to go to Dr. Willen's discussion, uh, please feel free to do so. And those of you who wish to stay and listen to and participate in the discussion with Dr. Young, if you'll move down to the front, uh, we can hear you better, and each of you will hear what the other person